Back on Sportsline, North Carolina national champions for the third time in a dozen years. Cutting down the nets this year after being denied on Chris Jenkins' buzzer beater a year ago. Last night, Joel Berry stole the show. Most outstanding players, 22 points, 6 assists. Carolina, a 9-2 run to close out the game. We'll have much more on the Tar Heels coming up in the last segment of the show. But as the NCAA tournament wraps up, I think it's always good to look at kind of the whole. And we had Kermit Davis on as our Final Four analyst on the Electric Power Company Sunday Sports Central on Sunday. And he looked at the Final Four matchups in the tournament. And we talked about Middle Tennessee and what they did this year, winning 30 games, getting back to the NCAA tournament, beating another Big Ten team in the tournament. And Kermit also gave his perception of some of the issues, perhaps, in the tournament. I thought the Blue Raiders were woefully underseated. So we'll talk about all that here. And last but not least, or maybe the first thing we talked about in the interview, and that's how I'll lead in, is he's got a new contract. A contract extension that will pay him three quarters of a million dollars a year keep him in the borough through 2024 just got a contract extension last year after beating michigan state but this year 30 wins another regular season and conference tournament title in conference usa and then the win over minnesota in the first round of the ncaa tournaments back-to-back -back years the middle has pulled an upset though as we'll talk about to see how much of a farce that was this year but pulled an upset in the ncaa tournament Pretty impressive stuff for the Blue Raiders. And we got the chance to congratulate Kermit Davis on his run and his new contract on the Electric Power Company Sunday Sports Central. Back with Kermit Davis now. And Coach, I believe there's some Power 5 schools out there that are really missing the boat by not just backing a Brinks truck up to your driveway and try and lure you away after the job you have done. But I'm happy, and I know the folks down in Middle Tennessee are happy that you are sticking around. What has made this such a happy marriage between coach and school? Well, two ladies on 1911 Estes Run in Murfreesboro <laughs> are the happiest people, my wife and my daughter, Allie. So, but thanks, Steve. You know, I'm so fortunate. You've got to have an unbelievable administration, and I really mean that. I mean, the president that hired me 15 years ago is still my president, Dr. McPhee, and, and I can call him, he's my boss, but I can call him a great friend, Chris Massaro, Coach Donnelly, two great athletic directors that I've had, so it really is, and, and you know what? We just think that we're we've on the cusp of something really, really fantastic and national, and we're not afraid to say it. We're not afraid to try to chase it, and we are. I'm, I'm, I'm right here in it to try to make Middle Tennessee one of the elite teams in college basketball. So we're going to go for it and see what happens. Well, it's easy to be happy when you're winning 30 games a year <laughs> in conference championships, but this season – you guys were expected to do it after last year. What's it say about your team and your guys that with the bullseye on their back, they were able to not just live up to, but even exceed expectations? You know, it's probably the hard part, and it was probably – the best thing that probably stamped our program. We still got a lot of work to do, Steve, that after the Michigan State, it kind of solidified us that we came right back. And we lost three starters. And we had this guy, Ja'Cory Williams, and Giddy Potts, great year, and Reggie Upshaw, and, and we added some other new players. So it's just the sustainability. I think it's the culture. I think it's the winning. I think it's how we go about our business academically and on the floor that, that really helps you in tough situations. A year ago against Michigan State, it may have been possible possible that you guys snuck up on the Spartans in the first round, but not this year. Everybody knew you were coming this year. Does it mean more that you were able to go in the tournament and beat another Big Ten team when they knew you were coming? No question. You know, Steve, we were, I didn't know this the other day. We're the first team in the history of the NCAA tournament to win back-to-back -to -back NCAA tournament games as the higher seed first time in back-to-back -back years so that says something yeah. about about your program and and we did we expected to be in Memphis we fell short Butler played good we wanted our best but give Butler credit but we went to the Minnesota game as favorites and that's pretty cool when Middle Tennessee can go into the games and people expect you to win because that's all we're trying to do we're trying to create expectations day in and day out you're changing the expectations for sure you talked about pushing it to be even better what is the ceiling, or is there a ceiling for what you can do at Middle Tennessee? 
I don't think there's a ceiling. Uh, we, we've taken great care of our assistant coaches, and I think that's a big part of it is the continuity. You know, obviously everybody knows about the quality of life. They have family, so they love it in Murfreesboro. So financially, when other schools have come calling, you know, reasons to stay. So that's a big part of it. And I just think this, the number one thing we've got to do, we've got to continue our program, we've got to get our league better. Conference USA as a whole has got to come. Okay, take South Carolina's run. Sure. They finished seven, you know, they were limping down, lost seven out of nine. We, we don't afford any of those possibilities in Conference USA. So we've got to get it where it's a multi-bid league and you don't have to be perfect in the tournament every year. Some people wondered when you made the move to Conference USA what that would do because you guys were rolling in the Sun Belt how has that affected the program? Obviously, you guys are still rolling in Conference USA. Steve, I think it's done a couple things. Is that the, the, the upper level schools in Conference USA are spending good money on college basketball. I mean, the Old Dominions, the UTEPs, the UABs, you know, Western Kentuckys. So, so those schools are spending, Charlotte's are spending money. So I think it's helped us increase our budget which impacts winning, helps us increase recruiting budgets, which impacts winning. And so all of those things, I think, go hand in hand. Now, what we've got to do is we've got to get the bottom half of the league to get better, start spending more money. I think we've got good coaches in place to where we can all have possibilities of top 100 wins in league play. So here's my concern, based off of what you just said. If you somehow would have lost in the Conference USA tournament, when you look at the seeding and the true seeds of the committee, I'm not sure you get an at-large, and that would have been just a complete injustice to college basketball and certainly your squad. Is the system broken right now? Well, there's a lot of smart people in the room, Steve. I don't know if we've gotten so data-driven. I mean, to me, I would. Uh, can you have the eye test and the field test and the look test? We you look guys pass play. that. No question. I mean, you, you, we put us up in any game when the ball tips. Our guys look like every team in college basketball now, and I think we play like it. So, to me personally, if I'm in the committee, I'm, I'm, what I'm using is the college USA Today poll the ones that the basketball coaches vote on. I think if, if we are so-called the experts of our sport and we vote who we think are the best teams, well, going into the last regular season poll, we're 25th mm -hmm. and Wichita State's like 18th or 19th. And they put Wichita State as a 10 and us as a 12. So to me, I would have a little more, maybe a little more presence of coaches on the panel and guys who maybe day to day can really have a feel of what good teams look like. And guess what happened with both those teams? They won a game in the tournament. Surprise, surprise. The only problem with coaches poll though is how many of you guys are actually voting yeah. in the thing. <laughs> yeah. You, you well, got to make sure all you guys are voting no if that's the case. That. It's not an SID. I agree. I totally agree with that. But I just think that's maybe a part of it that should go about it. And, uh, and hopefully, I don't know, I just think it makes the tournament what it is to have schools like Middle Tennessee, the VCUs, the Wichita States. So it's a great question. We thought we were going to get in, Steve, but I don't think it was 100% sure. Well, it's great when you guys advance, but it's also unfair to the higher-seeded team. I mean, if Minnesota, you could probably debate whether they deserve the five the way the season ended, but if they're truly a five seed, they don't deserve to play you in the first round. So if we're trying to make the tournament the best it possibly can be, it's important not just to get the right teams in, but to make sure they're seated on the right line, correct? I totally agree. I mean, how would you like to have been Archie Miller at Dayton? I mean, it worked out pretty good. He got a <laughs> good pay raise at Indiana. Yeah. But he's sitting there, and it pops up. He's a, and there comes Wichita State as a 10. And us coaches, we all think they're a 3 or 4. That's how they play. Mm -hmm. And uh, so you're right. It's not sounding arrogantly. But if you're Minnesota at a 5, they knew we weren't a 12. And Richard said that. He goes, gosh, Kermit, you look like you play like a 7, 8, or a 9. So sometimes the miss seating, it does hurt the other way around. You know who knew it? Vegas. <laughs> they had you as the favorite, so maybe we should just let them see the whole bracket. You talked about it, increasing the expectations. You've certainly done it now. Five conference titles in six years, back-to-back -back wins in the NCAA tournament, but I see a guy you got to replace, another guy down there. <laughs> How do you keep it going? What's next for the Blue Raiders? Yeah, because you start losing a guy like Reggie Upshaw and Ja'Cory, and not only are they very, very good talents, but they're great guys in the locker room. They're tough-minded. They're great practice players. So, but last year we lost Darnell Harris, Perrin mm -hmm. Buford, Jaquan Raymond, you know, and we, we weren't picked to win our league this year. So you get a guy like Giddy Potts who has a chance to be MVP of the league. We've got three starters back. We have a 6'8 guy sitting out. Just added a transfer we think is going to be a good player. We've got a good recruit recruiting class. So we're going to go schedule aggressively again, Steve, and see what happens. But again, I just think you
you lose really, really good players and you got to replace them and hopefully the culture of, of work takes over. Lately, it's been reloading though, not rebuilding. And that's nice for a coach to have. And you can't talk about it yet, but a big recruit on the way should sign sometime in the near future.